Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Focus on Liberia on this special, FOL special. My name is Dennis Jai, and we're broadcasting from Atlanta, Georgia. In our special broadcast tonight, we have FOL health contributor, Mrs. Abby Gaetala. She's a family nurse practitioner. She's joining us to talk about a visit with your doctor. When you visit your doctor, what is it that you need to prepare for? what to expect, and what do you do after the visit. Tonight is really special. Oh, not many times you see this kind of broadcast when we talk about your health, because it's very important. And so I have tonight, I have the honor to welcome Abby Tyler to focus on Labrador. Abby, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. We want to welcome all our viewers from across the globe to this special broadcast, Your Health, a visit with your doctor, what to do, what to prepare for before the visit, what to do during the visit, and what to do after the visit. Please uh, join us, share the show, and let's have a talk. Abby is a health contributor to Focus on Liberia, so we are glad to have you in our company. Abby, briefly, a little about yourself. I know uh, when you say FNP, that's Family Nurse Practitioner. What is that all about? Well, Family Nurse Practitioner is an advanced practice nurse, but you're actually not practicing as a nurse. You're practicing as a provider. So a, you go for your PCP, like the primary care provider, your internal medicine doctor. We go to school for about four years. You usually have to have your bachelor's of nursing first before going into the FMP school. You take advanced physiology, you take advanced anatomy and physiology, and you take um, med courses. I don't want to go too much into detail, medication um, courses to prescribe medications. We treat, we see patients, we treat, we examine we prescribe, we evaluate, we refer patients to other specialists and everything. We clear patients for, for tests. We clear patients for um, surgery, for um, work and everything. We do all of that. So everything that internal medicine does, we do it with very few restrictions. In certain, in certain states, I think about 27 states, nurse practitioner practice independently. And uh, in Pennsylvania right now, we still work with another, with a physician, but the visitor is not there in many offices. It's just uh, an NP depends on the practice now. And we do, I do, I work independently and I have a collaborating physician that uh, anything that's outside my scope of practice is what they take care of. So, so what's the difference between the MD or the, uh, that physician and the uh, FNP, what is the, uh, what do you call well, the medical doctors, doctor. and I don't, they're, they're the top level um, provider. So we're, we're considered a mid-level provider, meaning that when the um, insurance companies are pill paying and all that, they pay a little less than what they pay MD because MDs go to school for a much longer time, eight to 10 years, depending on if they specialize and all that. So we in no way compare ourselves to MD, but we're also considered providers and we still have the same responsibilities as providers as well. Like I said, in, in places where nurse practitioner practice um, independently, the responsibility is the same thing. Liability, I can get sued. I can do everything too. And even now, I have to retain my registered nurse license. But if I if I work as a registered nurse, even though I'm a nurse practitioner, my responsibilities and the liability are much higher because I'm trained on the provider level. So, so let, let's talk about you. I know we have our topic of visit with the doctor, but I want to uh, just get us from somewhere you FNP, I know you didn't just start being an FNP. You started from somewhere. If you don't mind, just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you started in this uh, uh, FNP journey. Okay. Uh, it's going to sound like when I'm telling my kids my immigrant story, and I'm sure they get tired of hearing it. And I thought I came to this country when I was this little. and I. But anyways, I when you know, went to high school here, I came here as a very young girl. I came went to high school here, came of age here. Um, went to college. I started off as a client care worker. So um, worked at Wood Services for those of you who, are, who live in um, Ben Salem, not Ben Salem, in the Pennsylvania area, Bucks County area. I started as a client care worker. I also work as a CNA, CN Certified Nursing Assistant. And um, I also work in the group home. So I worked in the hospital as well when I was working as a CNA and I worked in the group home because I needed to study and where I work provide me that time to study. Um, so I did that, worked hard. Me and my husband, we worked hard. And um, then I got my, um, I went to Bucks County Community College, got my 
got my associate of arts degree, my registered nurse. And um, then, you know, I had got married, had children. I wanted to go for my bachelor's after that. And then later on, I decided I went ahead and got my bachelor's. And then um, I got my master's and my, which is a master of science in nursing, family nurse practitioner. So if you see on my lab code on the flyer, it says certified registered nurse practitioner in, in Pennsylvania, certified registered nurse practitioner. Other states is advanced practical, you know, registered nurse practitioner. But um, that's where I am today. And um, I also run before Abby Tyler's Healthy Living. And I also contribute to my community, Liberian Community um, Association as well for our Labor Day thing and do some health education as well. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That's uh, your FNP, Mrs. Abby Gill Tyler. So Abby, we're here to discuss a visit with your doctor. You know, getting ready to visit your doctor. I want us to start very basic. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, how do I pick my, my doctor? I want a primary care doctor that I need to call on. What do I need to think about before even I pick that person? Well, most people um, pick their doctors, their um, family doctor, because you're a primary care physician. You need your primary care provider, not a primary care physician. Um, you you want to pick that person. Usually, no, I don't know too much about the insurance and all the different parts, but what I was told is that, and what I usually advise people is usually by word of mouth. You want to go to a doctor that you know understands your culture. And, or is willing to understand more because we all teach, we all um, taught with you know diversity and all. You want to go to somebody who respects and understands your culture, or is willing to learn past just what they're learning in school. Um, and usually, this for insurance purposes, they always tell you if you're not chronically sick, like if you don't have to see the doctor every month or every three months, you want to pick like the cheapest or the least expensive um, insurance because it's a lot when you take it from your paycheck every two months. So you want to take you know like my I have like. Um, Keystone Health Plan East, where I'm not paying so much money every month and I'm not paying so much uh, one out of pocket when I go see my doctor from my from my out of pay pocket, you know, I'm supposed to pay. So don't get something real expensive. But if you have you have chronically ill diabetes, kidney disease, um, uncontrolled di um, diabetes and all that blood pressure, you want to pick something that's reasonable that even though it's still going to be expensive because they will be taking a whole lot out of your pocket, but you want to just do as much as you can. And if you have children, if you can afford, there's also children's health insurance in Pennsylvania and every state too. So you can say, I'm just covering myself and my spouse, or I'm just going to cover myself for now. And then, you know, go, go and do the low income insurance for um, my children. And also there's Obamacare too. That's pretty reasonable. So you can do that if you're not, that, you know, if you're, like I said, if you're not chronically ill, you go for the least expensive plan. And sometimes uh, you have the uh, challenge of picking either a male doctor, a female doctor. Also, you have a uh, NP, you have a uh, family doctor, you have internal medicine. You know, for the uh, for your regular family doctor, not a specialist. What else do I look for? Do I want to see someone who is who has MD to their name, or do I go through the reviews, or do I pick someone? who is an internal medicine provider. Tell well, me about that a little bit. Like I said, um, you know, when you're picking your doctor and all that, um, usually it depends on the practice. You can always call the practice ahead of time because usually they were in your in your insurance, if you don't know who to pick, you can call your insurance, the number in the back of the card, and they will recommend which insurance that's in that area, that which doctors in that area that you can pick from. And you can just call the office. You can say, you know, I'm calling to find out. Um, it doesn't matter if it's MD or NP. So, like I said, once again, depends on the practice. Some um, practices have NPs and PAs and uh, the doctors there. So it depends on who you're going to get when you get there. But you can always call ahead of time and say, I prefer a female doctor. I prefer a male doctor. I prefer a, you know, the NP. Like if you came to my practice, you're going to be seeing me. My, my collaborative physician is not there. She's not physically on, on the building. So you're going to be seeing me. And um, she has other patients that she see that she was seeing before I got there. So those patients were specifically her patient. So she sees them, but, you know, all the patients see me. And you can see, you know, you can say, okay, I don't want an MP or I don't want this. That's up to you. But we both do the same thing, pretty much. Like I said, we're very few restrictions. So we still, like I said, we examine, we treat, we evaluate, we refer and all that. So and you can also say, some people might say, I want a doctor that looks like me, you know, and you can always call ahead. It's, like, it's just a way you can ask to, you can say, I'm just yeah. going to find out, you know, and they will tell you, it'll be like, okay, some people will be taking it back and saying why, 
But as long as the person understands your culture or is willing or seem like they understand your culture, because the patients that I have overwhelmingly are not my, you know, mine, they're not black, put it that way. And, and I'm like, I'm used to diversity because where I worked before we had everybody there. So I'm used to that and I'm willing to learn more. I'm learning all the different customs and all that from the different cultures that I work with over the time. So patients can pretty much sense that. They can sense that when they come to see you and you seem like you're not just looking at the paper and then just looking at them, just what's written on the paper, but you're also like willing to learn about them. And yeah. that kind of, you know, forms a strong bond that regardless of what color or nationality you are, the patients can sense that. So, so why is it important that we have a primary doctor? Well, the reason why you need a primary care product, um, provider, because I'm sorry if I keep saying provider because people think it's like doctors, but we're a care provider. It used yeah. to be physician before, but um, it's interchangeably. So, um, and all oh, doctors don't come at me. <laughs> so um, it's important because most of what we're concerned with in the primary care is screening and preventing. It's preventative care is like our main, main thing. So because when you come, most people will be like, eh, I'm fine. There's nothing wrong with me. So I don't need to go see the doctor. And most people don't come, especially if they're healthy or they seem healthy. They don't come until something's wrong or they have to have a physical for work or something like that. But it's important that you do come to your family doctor every year to make sure that you're getting your, your vital signs, taking your blood pressure, your temperature, your pulse, your pulse ox. And also we're looking at your weight. We're looking at your height. If everything is supposed to be where, where it, within range, um, we're looking at medication. Also, when you come to see us, we do our examination. There could be like a little um, bump on your shoulder or something in the back that you haven't seen before that I can just by looking at you and, you know, examining your skin, I can see to make sure that you're not developing skin cancer and black people do get skin cancer too. So in case that people are thinking that I can see, I can look at your feet. I can see you probably have swelling or you have some discoloration. So some things that you may not and feel or something that don't have any, that doesn't manifest itself in any symptoms. You want to make sure that your doctor sees that before you start getting to that point, because by the time you come to us and we say, Oh, I don't like the way your feet look. Or I don't like that color of that. I don't see your stomach is a little bloated and we send you for testing and it comes back with like stage two, stage three, and we don't want that. So we want to make sure you come to us. We screen you. We, you, we do your, your routine test. Every patient that comes in, a new patient comes in, we do a routine test. We check for your anemia. We check for anemia. We check for, um, any kind of infection, we check your um, beta metabolic profile, which is your electrolytes, all the chemicals that run your body. We check your liver function. We check in to make sure you, your A1C, we make sure to see that determines what are your diabetic. We also check for your thyroid issues because some people have high blood pressure, uncontrollable high blood pressure. And sometimes we, you know, they don't know that it could be the thyroid because the thyroid, you know, gland is the one that controls everything. So it could also be your hormones. If you have female, have some issues with your hormones and that also comes from the thyroid on your endocrine system too. So all of that, we do the baseline. And then when we get the results back, we'll call you back in or call you on the phone and discuss those information with you. And if we need to send you to another doctor, to another specialist, things we take care of what we can take care of there because I can start you on insulin. I can start you on medication, the pill form for, for low thyroid or high thyroid. And then I can treat you up to a point. Then I say, okay, this is where you are. You need to go see a specialist. So right. our main thing is prevention. We also send people for colon cancer screening from age 45, some people 40 because their family members were diagnosed early. We send, um, we do, that's for men and women. And for women, we also make sure that you go see your GYN. We also make sure by age 45 to 50, we start doing uh, 42. We can start doing early mammograms and start teaching you breast cancer um, treatment uh, prevention. So there's so many things that we do to screening that your everyday thing, we look at your weight and tell you how to eat healthy. So those things, a primary care for a physician, you need that for prevention. And then, like I said, start of any treatment and making sure we carry on from there. So it's very important that you may not seem sick, but something else may be going on yeah. that to get checked. We, we've heard a lot of stories, you know, especially, you know, among us Liberians or immigrants or black people that, oh, the person was not sick. What happened? So how often should I see my primary care provider? Right now, the guideline states one um, every year, but that depends. You come to see me the first time around and I we look at your blood pressure or I look at your heart rate or I see something that's concerning to me. I will tell you that um, we'll send you for some testing. And also I may want to we could do the testing and I say, OK, I don't want to start you any medications yet. Can you start doing these things? 
that you need to do some preventive care, do everything on your own first. And then I need to see you back in three months. We'll check you again and go from there. So right now the guidelines show if you're healthy for a healthy person it's once a year and then according to how your medical um, status is. And you can say, we'll see you every three months or we'll see you every six months or so. And then if you need to make, if you make, make, make an appointment, if anything, if you're sick or something happens in between time, like I usually tell patients, you know, follow up in three months or six months or sooner if needed. So the guideline says one year and then according to your medical status. So besides my primary care provider, should I, you know, see other providers like specialists on a routine basis or only if I have issues? If you, if, uh, first of all, you need to see those people and you can't see, it depends on your his, your insurance now if you don't need referred to go see those people. But usually you start with your primary care provider and then we look at what needs to be done. We look at your history also. Because if you came to me and you already have medical history of other issues and I'm going to and look at your medications, if I can handle, if I can provide a care for you in the office there or I can take care of you based on my scope of practice, I do that. But then usually I will refer you to, let's say if you are having chest pain and I did your EKG in the office and I read it and it looked um, abnormal, of course, and you're having blood pressure, I might take care of the blood pressure part, and, but I need you to go see the cardiologist, follow with the cardiologist and the cardiologist can do more extensive testing. Also mm -hmm. for the fact that when um depending on what kind of testing that we want, the insurance company might be like, no, we wanted to see a, a specialist first and because sometimes they don't want they don't want to pay the money right away unless if they absolutely have to because the insurance company is also a business. So they might right. say, okay, you know, let the person go out to the, the specialist and then see if that specialist can write for it and maybe then they might do it. But usually also when you're diabetic, if you're really bad diabetic, like if you kept coming to me and I'm putting in different medications and we're doing your blood work and your numbers are not looking where they need to be and I'm going back and forth asking you, are you taking your medicine? I think if it's a little bit more um, to where, like it, once again, I fall back in my scope of practice. I might say, okay, follow with, with um, endocrinologists and see. And sometimes those doctors, it's kind of hard to get to them right away. So in the meantime, I'm still taking care of those patients. I still have to continue taking care of them anyways, because all those test results come back to me. The consultation comes back to me. I need to read it. I need to, you know, fine tune the case and also everything. I'm like almost like the gatekeeper that everything I send you out, everything comes back to me and I need to look at everything else that that, that those other doctors wrote and coordinate the care, put it that way. So ladies and gentlemen, this is Focus on Liberia. We are discussing with... Uh... Mrs. Abigail Tyler, I will topic a visit with your primary doctor or with your primary provider. What do I need to know? What can I do before getting there, before, during, after the visit? So let's start the ball rolling by saying, I have my appointment is uh, due tomorrow or the day after. What preparation do I need before I see my primary provider the next day based on my appointment? Uh, I would say if you're somebody who can remember all your medications and all that, it's important that you remember every medication. And it's important that you come and don't say, I take one medication for my diabetes. I take one blood pressure, one medicine for my blood pressure, because there's so many um, medications out there that you take, especially if you come into me for the first time. Um, so make sure you have everything written down somewhere or have every, we have, like I tell people, we have a lot of secret apps. Now, where if you don't want anybody looking at your phone to see what kind of medications you take, you can just put in there. You can bring a list from your pharmacy, bring that. If you, know, you come in with your insurance card, you come in with your driver's, with driver's license or ID card, because all of that is legal. You have to have, for legal purposes, we have to have all that information down. Um, if you can bring somebody, if you need to bring somebody with you when you come in, we're going to actually consent first, and especially if you're over 18, we're going to check first to make sure that that person, you want that person in the room with you. Um, you may not want your spouse and your spouse can come in. We can, can't say it was same place because it's your spouse. You may want to discuss something that you don't want your spouse to hear. Um, if you're a child, if you're, I especially told people to it because I did a um, video about this. If you're a young kid, young kid, young person that's coming from uh, from pediatrics over, you could draw in family medicine, elderly, elderly people, and older people, um, you might want to bring your, your parents with you or just have them on the phone because most most people like 18, 19, or even around like 25, 26, when they're getting off their parents' insurance, they don't know a lot of things that happen or they can't remember the exact dates or whatever happened. So make sure you can have them on the phone and just ask them, we'll just ask, is it okay that we talk to them at the same time? Bring that... Um, if you have any test results, if you're in the emergency room, bring the discharge instructions and just, you know, come, come prepared 
like I said, bring those, those are major things that you need to come because they're going to ask you that. They're going to ask you and make sure you know your medical history too, because we're going to be asking you all those things and have like approximate dates. If that's, if that's possible, like, you know, ask, but when did I have this surgery? When did I have this? I mean, my children, you know, all those different things to have it written down. So when we're asking you those questions, you're not forgetting, especially when you come to the place the first time, you're not forgetting because we got like 15 minutes. So I'm going to be, you know, we're getting the questions out like that. So you have them and be like, okay, yeah, I remember that. I remember that because it's very important important that sometimes you may have one information that may trigger your whole changed uh, plan of care. Like the physician might say, um, oh, okay, you had a sudden death. Your mother or father or brother had a sudden death. That changes everything if you come in with headaches yeah. or you have high blood pressure. So it's important to have all that information. And of course, our culture, we don't talk about our health history to anybody else. So in as much as you can gather information from family members, especially your first degree relatives, your parents, your siblings, and probably your grandparents too, that would be good for us to know. And, and when I get there, I mean, there's a lot of paperwork to fill out and those can be very annoying. How do I prepare, you know, so that I fill out those paperwork correctly and, and get provided information that I need to provide? Most of the times, uh, even now, uh, most doctor's offices will send you the information when you do make the appointment, especially the first time around, will send you information, email it to you. So you can have most of those information already filled out and send it to us and we can have everything input into the computer and have it ready. So when you come there, you're not forgetting something important. Or even sometimes if you may not, and some people don't have email and some people cannot fill things up like that. So you could... Um, have it, you just have it written down on there, just fill everything out and bring it in and we can just scan it right into the computer because that takes time. And when you sit in yeah. there, you may forget something very important. So it's very important that you come and come early, come like at least 30 minutes early if you don't have that information already and be there to write everything down because we'll actually with your insurance, your ID, your family, your family history, what do you smoke, what do you drink, your allergies, very, very important, your allergies. Please, please, please remember that. Food allergies, drug allergies, um, anything that happened before. What kind of allergies? What happens if you listen? Okay, I'm allergic to shrimp. Okay, what happens when you when you when you eat shrimp? You may say, oh, I just kind of itch a little bit, or my throat closes. Two major things. Okay, so it's very important. I'm trying not to use big words here today because I'm not speaking to a general audience. Okay, mm -hmm. so you want to make sure you have that. Um, any kind of medication that you had, uh, surgery. If you had any problems with surgery before, anesthesia and all that. So have all that information ready. So because it's going to be in front of you and then they're going to be asking about your job and if you're married, children and just your social history because all of that is important when I'm putting my plan yeah. of care together to know because if you say, I have this, I have that. And I look, I say, okay, where do you work? You've been having a lot of coughing, you know, coughing for a while now. And I see that you work somewhere where you're exposed to fumes and things like that. That can direct my plan of care differently too. And who I may send you to, to refer you to, to another specialist to also work in coordination with me. Yeah, also uh, some, uh, now we have patient portal. You know, some may, if, if, you, if you have that, I think, uh, because that's what I use. In, in uh in in the place of Georgia where I am, we we that is called my chat. So mm -hmm. I can go on there and uh make an appointment without even calling. I can also fill out those kind of paperwork. Even though if, when I get there, I may still be required to fill out one or two things that were not there, but at least it reduces my time significantly that I have to be waiting there filling out paperwork. Yes. So yes, I, I, I arrive at the uh, place there. I had an experience where when you get there, they take you into a room and you think you're going to see the provider right away. And you are there like forgotten about. What should I expect when I get to, to the doctor's office in the morning or whatever time I have? Well, when you get there, um, like I said, it's best to get there early. And um, you get you get all your information, especially if you're a returning patient too. They might ask you, um, has anything changed in your insurance? Has any your address? Has anything changed in your medications list? Um, so all of that would be updated. And while they're updating that, I'm the provider. I'm in the room. I may be with another patient, or I may be in, in my office, and I'm looking up the screen. I'm looking to see, and I'm also reading the last time I saw you what I what I wrote, and also what the changes that I made, or the plans that I made, or whatever we discussed the last time. So I'm reviewing that. So why didn't they do that? And they bring you into the doctor's office, and the medical assistant bring you to the doctor's office. Some places have nurses there, but the nurses do something different. So the medical assistant bring you in. They call it roaming in. 
So they have to do your vital signs, your blood pressure, pulse, everything. They weigh you. They may ask you some more questions and something else. And if anything else that showed up on the paperwork that you completed, they may ask you stuff in the room because other times there are other people sitting in, in the waiting room too. So you don't want for privacy issues. They may not ask you certain things like that. And you go in the office and tell you, and you'll be in there and they'll tell you, okay, the, the provider will be coming in to see you soon. Doesn't necessarily mean I'll be in there right away. I, I try my best to get in, but there are times where somebody comes in and say, oh, my foot's hurting. And then they'll be in there. And then next thing they'll be like, oh yeah, oh, doc. oh yeah, while you're here, while I'm here, um, I've been having, you know, pain in my eye. So then that stops me right away. That slows me mm -hmm. down from going to the next person. And and sometimes I may say, okay, come back, we'll see that. But if that, if whatever that person is discussing is telling me at the last minute is very important, I have to take care of that. So sometimes, usually when I go to the next room, I kind of apologize. I say, you know, I'm so sorry that I was, you know, a little late and all, but um, somebody else, yeah, had mm -hmm. something else that I had to take care of. And and sometimes even when the patient comes in something that we don't know. There are things sometimes they have the symptoms that we don't know and we might want to talk to another so a specialist. I will call one of my specialist friends, you know, within the same network and not violating any privacy issue and be like, you know, how would you deal with this? And then can I send this patient to you later on after I see them here and things like that. So, but there are times where, you know, the waiting is not because you're just sitting there. The waiting is because we're doing something else and then we're coming to you next. Because when you're on the screen, it shows you came in he, this time and then usually we will we, we have to see you within maybe 20 minutes of the time you came into the room so when you get into the room it's when we start counting how long you've been waiting unfortunately sometimes it's a little longer but we yes try. it can be and, and you know when i'm filling that paperwork and they have a like a chief complaint they say what are you here for and i put one thing sometimes when you get to see the doctor do i do i build up on that or do I add more? You know, sometimes there is a little urge to say, oh, I, I think or I, I can say more. Or do I have to stick to that plan? Okay, you said this is what you came here for. You can't tell me anything else. Is, is that the uh, issue? Do no, you get no. more because I'm adding more? No, sometimes the chief complaints, you have like three chief complaints because sometimes one complaint, one illness or whatever is bothering you, the complaint can have other issues, other um, illnesses or other things that are surrounding it. Because also when you, because when you come into there, you come in and you say, okay, I can't with shortness of breath. And then I'm going to go to H HPI, which is called history of prison, you know, present illness. So I'm going to start asking you. And the first thing I'm going to ask you, when did it start? Because usually we start with the onset. So then sometimes when we start asking, when did it start? How, you know, when, when do you feel it more? How long does it last? Um, what have you taken so far? What makes it worse? What makes it better? What, anything else that is serving your life. So you may be, you, and all the same time, that could be two different complaints. Cause I have patients, sometimes they have like one complaint and it'd be like, okay, I have one more thing again. So if it's pressing and it's something that I need to address, I'd be like, okay, yeah, sure. You know, but like I said, at the same time, you know, I know that it's 15 minutes, but of course I try to make time. If it's very important, I may say, okay, yeah, let's take care right. of this now and then move on. So it's not, you're not just stuck to just, I came here for a headache and I'm taking care of a headache because when you have a headache and I'd be like, oh. You're here for a headache, but I'm looking at your blood pressure and it's pretty high. So that may be why you're having a headache. And um, by the way, do you smoke? You know, you'd be like, yeah, I'm smoking like 10 cigarettes a day. Okay, well, let's talk about that too. So because when I do go in, when I do and do my documentation, I'm also billing for the fact that you came here with a headache. I'm talking about the fact that you, you had a high blood pressure. And at the same time, you know, you're talking about smoking cessation. I talked to you about healthy eating. So all of that, when we making our plan for care and billing, insurance company we're talking about that and that also we build the insurance company for and also the, again that's the prevention because we tell you that if you're doing this this and this and this these are these are going to be the outcomes so you want to make sure that you don't do those things or try as much as possible to start cutting back cutting back cutting mm. back so all these go on behind the counters because i mean you you go visit your doctor you sit in somewhere you see a lot of movement you know the nurse is this person going this place give me a picture of what goes on behind there well usually when you when you're there the, when we, with the mas usually like they're entering everything that you're that you just told them they're entering all your information and sometimes like i said i'm sitting in my office and then i'm looking to see what they're entering too at the same time and then at the same time they're also taking care of other patients because i may be seeing another patient that will come outside and be like oh by the way i need something 
oh, I need, can you give me this paper? Or can you look up? This person just told me that they were in the emergency room, but I'm looking at my screen and I don't have any medical information. I don't have, or this person saw this cardiologist that I sent them to, but I don't have any of the consultation notes. So can you and call the hospital? Or can you call the doctor's office and have that faxed over? At the same time, they're doing billing. They're doing so many other things and making, making sure, getting calls from the pharmacy. Sometimes they call me out of the room because I have to come and see certain things or there's so many things that they're doing besides just taking care of you or just preparing for you to go into the room. They're working like three or four different patients at a time, talking to different doctor's offices and all that. Sometimes they're talking to vendors or people who are coming in for a med rep, you know, drug rep and all that. So it's a lot of things that's going on. And then I'm there like telling them other things. And sometimes they come in the room and be like, oh, by the way, by the way, by the way, by the way. So then I come outside and say, okay. Mm -hmm. So we're busy, very busy. with right. Should, should I be concerned that uh, like the nurses, you know, you know, the people are talking about me. There are some who you are shy, but then you see the group of people behind there talking to each other. This person is saying this. They're going to. Should there be any concern that uh, my health issue is being discussed or that uh, you know people talk? Right? I don't like people talking about me. Should, should that be a concern? Talking, with... As long as people who are talking about you are working in office, that's then then they're they're you know they're sworn. You know, they're by by law, they're you know required to keep that information private. But, but Abby so, and my friend, these same people may, may be in my community now they know I have this kind of sickness. And you know, because the doctor, the nurses, the MEs, and all these people are just like, okay, I don't want to know about my business and put it out there. It, it, should that be a concern for patient? I understand the concern, and that's why some people be like, "Oh no, I can't go to um, I can't go to this doctor because I know this person works there. I can't go to this one because this person works there." And even with me, like for me to go to um, accountant, I'd be like, "I'm not going to no library accountant and be putting my business on the street, <laughs> you know." So I don't want that. That's why I say I prefer to go to American accountant because I don't want my business out there. So at the same time, which is the same concern, is you know reasonable with regular people who um, want to don't want to go here because this person's saying that, but. I've had Liberian patients too. I've had um, many Liberian patients over the years. I, but I'm so sometimes they'll see me and you know, and they'd be like, "Oh yeah, that goes my doctor. Oh, that goes my nurse." And and I'd be like, "Hi," and they might say, ask something, and I'm like, "How are you doing?" You know, unless if you come and say something to me, and I just know you. You just know me as Abby or Abigail. But we are by law, regardless of what I saw you, whatever part of your body I saw, you know that I'm required to keep that private. So if you hear it somewhere and you know, you only told me and hear that we have a license to protect and we have, you know, total liability insurance and all that. So yeah, trust me, when you get to that point, you understand your responsibilities and you understand how hard you work for your license. You're not gonna go running out there telling anybody, anybody else's business. So rest assured that your, your information is safe with professionals, professionals. <sighs> <laughs> All right. My next question here is, uh, sometimes I meet the doctor and I forget some of the things that I really should have said. And because sometimes you meet the doctor, you don't feel that pain again. It's something psychological that uh, my foot was hurting, but now I met the doctor. It, it doesn't hurt that much. So sometimes I forget some of the things that I should have said. When I, what do I do? I forgot them. Now I'm home. Oh, now I remember. Do I go back there? Do I set another appointment or what do I do? I usually tell people when you come into the doctor's office, like you come in there, like the game for your chief complaint, you can also write, write your things down say, these are the things that I want to discuss with my doctor when I get there. Um, you know, say, okay, this is this. Like I said, we we're actually certain things that so you said, oh, my foot was hurting last week, but it's not hurting. I mean, sometimes you just bring it up. We'd be like, okay, then I may say, um, what did you injure yourself? When did it start hurting? Because once again, I can take care, you know, depending on the priority of the problem, I can say, let's take care of it now. Or just, I, can, I may say, keep an eye on it. If it continues hurting you or anything like that, then let me know later on. Of course, after you told me that, I'm going to be reviewing your chart some more. And if I say, you know, I would tell the MA and say, okay, that person told me that and all that. So I tell them, I make an appointment that I want to see them, tell them to come back in another time or soon so I can see them if that, if that, if it continues because we say notify the office if problem persists or worsen okay so I, I say the best thing to do is write your questions down okay like four person questions and all that write it down 
and in order of like priority, okay, this one's bothering me this much, this one bothers me a less, little less, a little less and all. So when you go to the doctor's office, you'd be like, okay, I'm here. And they'd be like, okay, these are the things um, that concerns me right now. And sometimes, you know, we find that very helpful because then we know we can narrow down the plan of care and know how to take care of you better. So just write it down and we can discuss it. And if we can't take care of it at that time, we'll tell you that, okay, we'll take care of it another time. If it doesn't seem like it's bothering you that much, we'll take care of it another time, but just keep an eye on it and let us know. Please let us know if it bothers you, make an appointment to come back in to get checked. So now I've seen you saying the doctor is time to check out. So the, doc the doctor tells me a lot of things to do, you know, drink plenty of water, take exercise, eat this, eat that you know, do this x-ray. So after I leave from the doctor's office, you know, maybe you have to pick up medication, a lot of things to do. How, how do I really make sure that I can comply with all what the doctor told me? Once again, um, I, I usually tell, I say, okay, we'll go over it. I'll, after I say, I say these things and then I'll say, okay, do you have any questions? And they say, oh, can you please explain that to me? And most people who like have issues with remembering or I, it may be a little bit overwhelming, I try not to make the discharge instructions or, you know, when you leave the doctor's office, I try not to make it too complicated. So I'll say, okay, these are the things that we're going to do. You're going to do this, this, and this. If you want to write it down, we can do it. Some offices already have it typed up and give it to the, give it to the patients. We're not there yet. So then that's different from the hospital. So I may say, okay, these are the things I want you to eat healthy. I want you to, you know making sure you're eating, stay away from the rice, or cut back on your rice intake, watch your portion. I say, remember, brown, 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 brown rice, um, wheat bread, um, wheat pasta. You want to drink enough water. It, that depends on if you have any kidney issues. I'm not going to go too detail into that. You want to make sure you eat healthy, exercise at least 30 minutes a day. Find a way that you remember certain things. Make a, make a rhythm or a rhyme out of it so you remember things. Say, okay, show me 30 minutes a day, three days a week or more. So you got your three and three. You should want me to eat a lot of brown things, brown things and fruits and vegetables. You want me to, um, you know, decrease my stress. So, and sometimes you can just write it down. Be like, doc, you mind if I write it down to you? And I, you know, I just write it. And if I'm saying doc, all my patients call me doc, even all my, my people in NP in groups, we walk in there, we'd be like, my name is Abigail. I'll be your provider today. I'm the nurse practitioner. And they'd be like, thank you, doctor. So it's like, I'm not, yeah. Most people yeah. don't know what to eat, so I just so we just tell them to say, just write it down, and and you can always I always tell my patients if you have any questions, you can always call back and just say and, yeah. and people do call back. They'd be like, wait a second, she told me I was supposed to do this or something like that. I just called back. But, and but, but, I mean, that's the problem. When you call back, you don't get to speak to the doctor. You don't because they can just read the um, MAs can just read the notes and see what I wrote, and I say mm -hmm. you know like in my plan when I see you, your the subjective is what you told me, everything that's going on. The objective is what I examine when I examine you, the assessment or your diagnosis, and then the plan is these are the things that I plan to do. So I write everything down in my notes. So if they may say, oh, um, this patient said you were going to order her X-ray. But um, I see it in your nose. Did you forget or something like that? I may say, oh, yeah, no, I did that. Or even sometimes we will forget. I may do that and follow up from there. Or sometimes the patient may be like, oh, you know, she said she was going to do it. When does she want me to come back? And then I said they follow up in two weeks because your blood pressure is high. I want you to see that. So they can look in there and see that. And sometimes if they call, if I'm free, I'll be like, put them on the phone. I'll talk. It's just that it's impossible. It's not always um, feasible to talk to a patient every time they call because sometimes when they call and they're talking for a longer time and I have a patient, if I'm in a room with a patient or coming from the room or doing something else, I can be disturbed because I need to focus on what I'm doing. So it's not always feasible to talk to them directly, mm -hmm. but they can read the note and they can leave a message and I can always call them back. Because I, when I was in uh, Pennsylvania, I had a doctor in Levittown, Dr. Morgenstein, my brother told me he, he retired. And uh, this doctor, whenever you call, he's going to talk to you or he's going to, if you don't have to come in, because sometimes I feel like the doctors are just after my insurance money. So by the time you call, they say, oh, make an appointment, come in. Make, you know, how do you draw that line, what you can see on the phone and what the, the, uh, the patient can come in for? Dep that also depends on your insurance too, because some insurance will pay for telehealth, meaning you can see the person through a video or you can just talk to them on the phone. I usually, if I, if the patient does, and if the insurance doesn't cover telehealth, then you have to come in for me to discuss a test results. And then sometimes there are certain test results I want you to come into so I can look in your face and you can see me. And sometimes it requires a level of sensitivity as well. 
So your men want you to come in. And something is very, you know, crucial that I need you to come in. So not only just telling you about the test result, because I can tell you, oh, this is, you know, you have a red shoe, but I need to explain everything about that red shoe to explain how important it is for you to follow up to get the red shoe fixed. So yes, we'll call you in. And sometimes we talk, we schedule telehealth and we have, I have a list of people who I call and tell and be like, by the way, your numbers are a little elevated. I want you to work on this because we're documenting every time we call you too. So that's an appointment. But during the, during the pandemic, a lot of things was done like telehealth and if you didn't need to come in. So I try my best that if you don't need to come in, we talk to you on the phone. But if your insurance doesn't cover telehealth, then you need to come in, unfortunately. And sometimes when people come in too for to explain uh, the test results, they also have other issues when mm -hmm. they come in because they'd be like, oh, yeah, no, you came here, came here for you to discuss my cholesterol and my diabetes and all that. But by the way, so had you not come in, you probably wouldn't have said that. So right. it's also it helps us and it helps the patient as well. So talking about test results, you know, sometimes you do all these tests. They don't call you when everything is good. So I'm wondering, as they only call you if things are bad. So I'm wondering if doctors are only interested in giving bad news. Why can't you call me with that good news? I usually tell my patients because I say, well, you will get your lab work done. Um, we'll get the results within 48 hours. It takes me a little while to read it because I have a whole lot of patients and other test results that I have to read and consultation notes from other doctors as well. So I'll tell them I will get the results in 48 hours. I'll look it over. And if it's fine, I'll probably just tell the MAs to, um, you know, tell them, say, can you call this patient and tell them the numbers were fine, um, continue the medication they're taking. And they want to call in to ask me any questions to do that. But if then, if, and then, so if I'm calling to tell you, you say you, I'm checking your diet, you know, A1C for your diabetes and your numbers are good. I'll just say, you know, just tell them that you don't need me to call that, but we do document that we called you to make sure that you know that. But, um, if the numbers are bad, yes, then we need to call you. It sounds, it sounds like, you know, we only call them for bad news, but it's important that when we call you because we're also developing the plan of care. So we're making sure that we call you and say, oh, by the way, your A1C went up slight date and this is what I'm going to do. I have to change your medicine. I have to put you in different medicine or increase the doses. So it's not just a phone call. And so usually if you don't get a phone call back, be happy. So I, I started telling patients, I say, we may not call you if anything, if everything's okay, we may not call you or the MA will call you and tell you your numbers are fine. Just uh, follow up with your next appointment. But if I call you, then I'm calling you to tell you. And the number, it's not always bad. It's, you know, the numbers are there to like help you keep, to keep you healthy, to keep you in the straight and that, not straight and that road, but to help you keep you healthy. Cause you'll say, oh, she told me my cholesterol was like two something, you know, so ooh, I could have started eating healthy and she told me this and all that. So. <laughs> but it's funny because I tell my cousin, I said, there are times where I see people who are um, members of my forum and I see them and see them somewhere and they'd be like, okay, I already ate my salad. <laughs> like, I'm not looking at you. I just, I, you know, it's like making sure that, that, you know, they're eating healthy, you know, but patient yeah. usually we call, we call in just to make sure that we tell them those numbers and I can go over the plan of care, see how we're going to adjust your care. So Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Focus on Liberal Special. My guest family nurse practitioner, Abigail Tyler, we are discussing a visit with your provider. What, do you, what to expect, what to prepare for, what to do during the visit, before the visit, and also after the visit. We're gonna take a short break. When we come back, we're gonna open the phone line so you can call and join the conversation. This is the icon. We uncover talents that shine lights and showcase Liberia's unseen, unheard, and unnoticed acts to the world. The Icon, a pathway to stardom. The next big thing happening in Liberia. A Divine's event and consultancy international annual signature event. This is the Icon, the icon. The icon. a pathway to stardom. Welcome back. Those were some messages from our sponsors. Our discussion today, a visit with your doctor. My guest, Abigail Tyler, she's a family nurse practitioner, a health and wellness blogger, also a contributor 
here at Focus on Liberia. To be part of the conversation, we want you to call the number that is scrolling down the screen there. Call that number and uh, if you have a question or comment, please feel free to contribute again to join the conversation. 605-313-6004. The code is 791403. And uh, Abby will be happy to talk to you. All right. When I'm visiting the doctor, I mean, sometimes it takes a little longer. Sometimes I look at the doctor in this uh, computer world, look a little distracted. I see that uh, he or she is talking to the computer instead of me. And sometimes I look, it's like 15 minutes I'm out of there. I don't feel that connection anymore. What are doctors doing to, uh, to uh, or providers doing to, to combat that and give us the assurance that really we do matter? The reason is, okay, and as much with merge sensitivity, um, because most of what we do and the time limit that is put on us to see a patient and to document everything, and, and sometimes you have to remember everything the patient told you. I usually have my notebook too with me, so I can write things down in case I forget. But um, you have like a certain, like I said, a 15 minute window for returning patient and 30 minute window for returning pay for a new patient. So you have to get all that information and everything, you have to review everything over time. So at the same time, you're looking at a computer screen because when you're talking to the patient, you're entering information too. And it's mixed. And yes, yeah, sometimes it does seem like we're looking at a, com you know, we're looking at a computer screen. So I usually turn my, my computer this way where I'm looking at the patient. So I'm looking at them as I'm doing that. I usually get the information first that I need put it in. And then I say, okay, now I'm going to do your physical examination. So at least that way they have my attention when I'm getting the information down. And then also when I've done a physical examination. So I tried to put that in, but we're also under a lot of, you know, like it's not pressure, but we also, you have to see patients and it's an amount of time in order to make money. You have to see a, a lot of patients, but at the same time, you want to make sure the patient gets the best of care and the patient is your priority. So yes, patients have been complaining of that. Also over the years, we're working on that. We're saying, okay, this is, that's why I do, I do mine. Like I said, I go in there. Hi, how you doing? Hi, Mr. Ja. You know, my name is Abigail. I'll be your um, provider today. And I take that, you know, first five minutes or so have a little bit of small talk, but at the same time as I'm doing the small talk, I'm also like assessing you. So I'm looking at you and then examining you at the same time, looking at visual examination before I finally get to touch you. And I'm all, you know, recording that in my head and putting things down. So that way I'm not forgetting because in as much as we're doing that, we want to make sure that all the information that we need to treat you now. And later on, when you come back, when I go back and read that information, I need to make sure that it's in the computer and it's entered correctly. So we do our best. Yeah, but like, how are you doing? I'll make, completely eye contact and talk for a little bit and I may say something nice and sweet and be like okay well, I like your outfit today or you know you got a new haircut not you know just trivial conversation but just making a personal connection with the patients and my patients I might say they do love me so <laughs> I must be doing something right yeah, they, they let, let, me, let me look at some comments here a few comments and one question here uh, Alex Devine is watching from Monrovia I have uh, Pastor Patient said, uh, good job. Hey, Pastor Patient, how are you? Alan Summer said, what does race mean to a doctor? And he said, what does race means, what does race mean to a doctor when conducting an assessment? Okay. What does race, uh, well, we usually, because um, there's, certain, there's certain illnesses that are prevalent in certain race. So usually when I do write my, so we take that into account when we're looking at different things, because like black people, are higher rate of getting um, uh, heart disease, black people, are higher rate of getting high blood pressure, black people, are higher rate of getting kidney disease. Some of these, some of these that we don't know the reasons for, but also it can be contributed to uh, your lifestyle, to your genes and all that. So when we do our note, every time I write a note, we'll say, you know, Mr. Dennis, then patient is a, 51 year, 50 year old African American male. So when we're looking at that, we're taking all that into account. And I, I may tell, I may tell you, you say, okay, by the way, your blood sugar, your A1C is high. I'll say, let me list your risk factors. You're already, you know, you're 50 years old. Your A1C is high. Your high cholesterol, your cholesterol is high, and you're also an African American male or African American female. So those are risk factors that put your race into a higher category 
that this disease or these diseases run prevalent within your culture. That doesn't mean the other people don't have it. You know, mm -hmm. people say, okay, yeah, those other people get high blood pressure too, they get this, they get that. It's just that because we take that into account when we look at all the different risk factors and that's how we coordinate our care because we know, and I know I have to say uh, more things to you the same way with culture. I know very well that I'm not going to talk to you and say, oh yeah, Dennis, make sure you're not eating, eating too much pasta and this and that. When I know you don't eat pasta that much, you're going to eat rice. So looking at the race and looking at the culture and looking at the group within the race and culture, because it can be African-American person, but African-American person who is Liberian, who eat different things. So I need mm -hmm. to, when I try to teach you and give you the medication and all, I can tailor your plan of care individually to your race, individually to you as well. So it's not just, okay, this black man sitting in front of me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say, okay, you know this. No, 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 no. It's going to be the black man. But I'm also taking into account everything else that goes into it. Right. But there are certain diseases that are more prevalent in certain races that we have to tailor our care specifically towards. So, so will you know when, if somebody's palm butter eater will come to your clinic <laughs> and you advise it? Well, if, I wasn't like, if I was in Liberia, no, I wasn't even familiar with Liberian eat, no, no, but I would probably see that they'll look at their weight and sometimes it can be skinny and still have issues. Um, I could look at their um, the A1C. Usually, that would tell me that you eat a lot of starch. That you eat a lot of things that have like every sugar, carbohydrates, and all that. So, and I know like rice is very heavy, and most people mm. eat rice every day, and some eat it at least twice a day. So, I would know that's the main thing that goes back into race and culture again. Me learning different cultures and and saying, okay, this person sitting in front of me, I have to tailor my care to that. So, I'm gonna mm. look at the numbers. So, objective numbers will tell me that. And then also when the more I hear about you, the more you talk to me, then I start forming my plan of care based on that. That's why we also when we look at social history too. We actually social right. history like the work and everything else you do so we can get the full full picture of the person that we're taking care of. We have one caller, that caller drop off. Another caller is at someone is asking for the call number. It's right there on the screen. As a conference call number, call that and uh, get in the queue. All right, there's another question here from Alson Saba are NP supervised by medical doctors. I know we covered that from the beginning, but if you can throw more light on that question. We're not supervised. We work within our scope of practice. But, um, you know, we do, like I said, in about 27 states, NPs work independently. They have to state allow independent contractors. Um, my collaborative physician, she doesn't, um, she's not in the building. So I work by myself. I may call her and say, like I said, um, certain things that are outside my scope of practice, like when we're doing things that a patient needs at home, home care supplies and things like that. Apparently the insurance company wants MD to sign it and certain certain tests and maybe want the MD to sign it. But I'm seeing the patient. So usually she and I may work together and saying, I saw the patient, she'd look at my notes and see based on that. And then she might, you know, and just sign it. But she's basically just writing like a signature. But and also because I've been an MP for like one year, so I may, you know, throw things to her. And then she, but like I said, I'm there. If you come to if you come to where I work, you're gonna be seeing me. You're not gonna see her. So, right. so it's not the question about supervision. It's more of collaboration and uh, yes. Yes, uh, 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 and, we and we're not we're not working, and we're then that's what we call mid level providers. But we're providers, so we see, we treat, we evaluate, and everything we refer and all that. But basically, if anything, I'm like on my own when I stand in front of the judge. If I do anything, I know the the rules and liability that governs my license and all. So somebody's asking about eating fufu a day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's it. I said people eat like they eat fufu for you know they eat fufu they have it and bought a fufu and everything for for uh, for appetizer. I was like that's not appetizer. You know you don't eat that and then you go eat rice. You know if you're gonna eat fufu if you're gonna eat a fufu you know what to eat a little bit of it and then you can eat your rice that way. And then when mm -hmm. you're making sure you do the day you're doing that you make sure you're getting up and you're going for a walk right after that. If you had a party make sure you're getting up to dance because any little movement also kind of burns all that fat and burns all the carbohydrates and get it out of your body as quickly as possible. So, a Anything that I didn't ask that you want to elaborate on? Um, let me see. The most important thing, like if you're taking, if it's an elderly person, make sure that you, if you're taking the elderly person to the doctor's office, please make sure that, um, you ask them some information before, please make sure you bring all their medications in the original containers. 
because some people like the, you know, you thinking they're taking a medication and they're not taking it or they're not taking it the way it prescribed is prescribed. So make sure to bring the original containers. And sometimes you can just call and say, you know, my mom or my dad, are a little confused on the medications and I think they're taking it wrong. Can I come in? And so we call that medical management, medication reconciliation and say, come in and you bring everything in. We'll tell you, this is what you're supposed to take. This is where it's there. And depending on your culture too, then the instructions can be written within your language. I don't think you can do any Liberian dialects because it's not formal, it's not standardized. So everything will be, will be in English when it comes to Liberian stuff and making sure, and like I said, sometimes you come in and you can't remember certain things, make sure the person who um, who responsible for you or who can give you more information, they can be on the phone, they can come in with you, just tell them I'm bringing in my mom and have information ready when you come in, have any or your questions ready, have it written down and um, just be understanding, make sure that we're there, that we're asking you questions and all that. We're not just doing it just to be in your business. Mm -hmm. We're not scolding you when your numbers are not where they need to be. We're doing that. We, we emphasize on certain things because we want to see you healthy. So that's the most right. important. We're working. We have, a, we, have, we have a color here. Let me bring in the color. Color your name and where you calling from? Uh, my name is Jerome, calling from Shadow, North Carolina. Go ahead, Jerome. You're live. Thanks for calling. Thank you. I got a question. Uh, uh, thank you, Dad, for your great analogy. Uh, I just want to ask a question because uh, some of us from uh, Africa and our dad was born, mom and dad were born in Africa. And when you when, and we are here, when you go for a visit, they bring a chat uh, to you to ask you for your parents. Family history, uh, right? Uh, <laughs> family history. <laughs> and you don't know if my, my father was having high blood pressure or was, was having cancer or was having something as uh, 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 the line that we transfer to you, and you don't know this thing, and they ask you now, and then say now that you're confused, because it just happened to me just yesterday, they were asking me, I have some of them that bother me, I have been uh, uh, worrying, and I went there, they asked me this question, your, your father have this, your, father, uh, your, your parent have this, I don't know, so yeah. how will you justify that, or how will you uh, go about uh, answering the question, or know what's going on with you? Good question. Thank you. Usually, um, because like I said, um, most of us who are from, you know, out of the country too, and even people who are here back then, people didn't discuss about anything that family members are going through. You know, your parents are sick or this person was sick. So if you if you don't know, we just write, you know, patients on, you know, history, family history unknown. And then we just treat you as the person that we see in front of us. That's it. We may, we may, we may ask you questions that may kind of judge your memory. Like, um, do you remember him taking any kind of blood pressure medicine? Do you remember he ever talking about his heart problem? Do you remember? So we might just, we might include that in your history saying that the patient was not too sure, was not aware mm -hmm. specifically of what um, disease a family member had, but they did mention that some of the mem their father used to talk about his heart and he used to take pressure pills or we actually, most importantly, we actually also anybody complain of headaches during that time. Do you remember any time mm. somebody, they came back home and they said they had a stroke or they had weakness on the side, um, anybody just died suddenly and it wasn't like an accident or something like that. So we kind of ask them to judge your memory, but if you don't know it, then we just kind of work with what we have in front mm. of us. But Abby, why is that important? If you can emphasize that in one minute. Genes. Your genes. We tell people, we say, I, like I tell people, I said, I said, you eat healthy and do these things. Like I always tell people, I said, when we, when I get that, all the stats, I say, you know, and, and this year, 40,000 people will die from this, this, all those stats and everything. It seems so big and it's like re far removed from somebody. But I'll tell you, I'll say, Dave, I was say, Dennis, okay, you know, at least one person in your family that has high blood pressure, you know, one person that has diabetes, and all those people are related to you. Now that's your gene. That's your DNA that make contribute to any kind of sickness now or in the future, but that doesn't mean that you're going to get sick or have these diseases, but that's part of what you're working with. So when you add, when your lifestyle adds to that, that makes it even worse. Okay. So you're high risk for developing high blood pressure, you're high risk for developing diabetes, you're high risk for developing heart disease because you have a family history of it. So it's important that you work even harder to make sure that you delay those diseases or prevent complications as much as possible. So, you know, it's like, it's like saying if you and I were doing a race and I had, and I had something on my leg, I can't let go of it. It has to stay there. I have to work even harder to make sure I keep up with you. Right. So you come in with that already part of your DNA. You can't change that. You can't change your family history, but you can work as much as possible to delay it or prevent any complications based on what you do. You know, 
on that. Thank you. We'll, we'll also take another short break to uh, show you a lineup of our programs that are coming up. And when we come back, with, uh, since we don't have any more calls, we're going to get to your final comments and we're going to be closing the broadcast. But let's start here. Uh, tomorrow at 11 a.m., Anson Sia, the host of Hour of Politics, will be here with the B.W. Harris Alumni Association. They are having this year convention in Monrovia. So they're going to be here tuning to focus on Liberia at 11 a.m. for that program. Also, on Thursday at 12 noon, and soon as here, the host of Our Politics will be here with Mr. Mansfield G. Duopo II. He's a political scientist. They will be going to be talking about the We Are's first term, CPP, that's the Collaborative Political Parties and its prospects, and Liberia's political future. On Thursday, on Tough Talking Thursday, I'll be here. We're going to be talking about the topic, is the CPP dead? If yes, what is the cause of death and how can we avoid a CPP style sudden death? If the answer is no, what's next for the CPP? And where is the elderly statement, Mr. Joseph N. Buaka? On Friday, we have the literary hour, Feminism in Selected African Novels. Uh, Dr. K. Moses Namwe and scholar Jackie Sire, they are the hosts of that show. They will be here Friday at 6 p.m. Then, on Saturday, 12 noon, we're going to meet a new political party forming, the Tiawan Gonglo team. Team Gonglo will be here. They're going to be here on Saturday, 12 p.m. You don't want to miss that. Then, on Sunday at 12 noon, the former general in the rebel army is now Evangelist Joshua Milton Blahi. He's going to be here to have an exclusive interview with me. So Joshua Blahi, the one who fought in his nude during the heat of the Labyrinth Civil Crisis, has long since turned into an evangelist. He is doing some tremendous work in Liberia. He's going to be here so that we can talk about his former life and now his new life, the TRC report and war crimes court, his take on national issues, especially ritualistic killings and more. Then on Sunday, the CPP and CDC, again, the hour of politics, Mr. Ansunisia will host Robert Monsio Pade. Join us here at Focus on Liberia. We educate, we elevate, and promote all things Liberia. Uh, Abby, we still have well, a few questions here. Uh, this one from Bruce Harry responds to Focus on Liberia. Absolutely right to eat too much sugar. Okay. Doug Brown, oh, you are responding to somebody. All right. Hey, Bruce. I think that's all the numbers. Oh, Jerome, do you have anything else to say before I take leave of you? Okay, I think Jerome is fine. Abby, thank you so much for your time tonight. I will want to get your final comments and uh, almost a summary of what we've discussed. Hamilton Zilli say is following judiciously and is very educative. Thanks, FOL. Hello, 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 Anthony. Okay, go ahead, Jerome. Quickly, we're closing no, up. I was, I was on, I was on mute as well. Sorry. Okay. Uh, no, that's good. I, I think I, I, I like what she explained, and uh, uh, I think the the only thing here is that because some of us when we go to these places and you see them in the attitude, the question, and I start thinking, I wonder if I don't tell them this and I don't know if we. We didn't find out what is going on with me, or would they would they kill me, or would they find out the the root of the sickness, mm -hmm. uh, or would they not just find out and it would just maybe harm me uh, in the long run? So I be wondering what can I do when they ask me the question and I don't know the answer because my parents I don't know, but my parents was yeah. was young man. My father died, and my mom was over dad during the war. So I don't know what actually was yeah. the uh, uh, major sickness. So, and I'm here now in this country with all these uh, stuff that going on, technology that going on, and man charts, and they, they do this. So it's, it's I just want to yeah. 
Thank you, Jerome. Let me take one last caller. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Caller, your name and where you calling from? Caller, go. My name is Jackie. Jackie Jackson. Jackie Jackson. Ask me. We're calling from Rhode Island. Hi, right, Jackie. Go, go, go ahead. You're live. And, and you can turn the, the your Facebook off so you can hear us. Just feedback. Most of the questions have been okay. Hold on one second. So most of the questions that we have asked, um, people already have asked those questions, but we just want to say that we are so proud of you, Abby, for all that you have done. And the most important thing is that just hearing all that you have done, work history, and where you've come from, I think just people hearing this is going to empower a lot of young females who are lost and trying to find their way out there. So this is really good having this forum, and I'm so glad to have listened. And thank you for inviting us. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks. Thank thanks. You. It's very important when people, your you know, special people, appreciate what you do. Thank you. Sweet. Thank you. So, so Abby, we're drawing down the curtains again. Thank you so much for availing yourself to do this. And thank you for the work you do as a health contributor to your uh, focus on Liberia. Let's get your parting comments and uh, anything that we left out that we didn't cover or in the summary, please go ahead. Um, just want to say also October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I think we're supposed to be doing a show on that eventually sometime this month. Um, and also I did a, a, a show on domestic violence because it's also Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So for those of you who want to see that, it's on my personal page or you can just um, request a, a membership to Abby Tyler's Healthy Living. Domestic violence is something very, very prevalent in every community that I just, even our community. So I feel very passionate about it. I did my report on that when I was doing my bachelor's program. But most important, you know, to summarize everything, um, I'm very happy to, very happy that you asked me to be here. I always like teaching people, you know, from the time I was younger in school, back home, I used to see all those um, missionaries and Peace Corps. So I always wanted to be able to give back to my community. So that's why I started my forum and that's why I do this. Uh, but most important thing, you know, make sure you see your doctor every year. Like, like we said, like I said, every year is important. Most important is preventative care, preventative care, preventative care. So make sure you see your family doctor at least once a year um, so you can get your routine testing done. If any test that needs to be done, um, lab tests and then kind of imaging like your mammogram and uh, colon cancer screening. You want to get all those things before anything shows up later on. And if it do show up on, at least it can be detected early so we, you can get the um, better care that you need and uh, eat healthy. You can go online as dash diet is dietary approach to stopping hypertension. You can go in and there, Google that. It tell you how to eat healthy, exercise 30, uh, 30 minutes a day or more, three days a week or more, and decrease your stress, get enough sleep, especially if an adult, at least eight hours of sleep. Um, Turn off the devices before you go to bed, so you, right before you go to bed, so you're not dreaming about it and worry about everything else that goes on on social media. Um, drink plenty of water unless you have kidney diseases. And of course, everything I said here today is all guidance, and you need to check with your family doctor to make sure before you stop or commence any treatment. So see your family doctor or whoever your provider is and make sure you talk to them first. I mean, you can discuss everything I said to them um what well, i said here today and they can be like oh okay you know so you have this because usually they'll be like oh i have a i have a friend who's a nurse practitioner they'd be like oh okay so that means you know what you're talking about then and that doesn't mean only nurse practitioner or doctors know that but it's just that when you come from a place where people people who are trained in that area and you know people like that it kind of you know it's kind of impressing so but um i thank you for having me i really appreciate it and those who want to join my forum come on there and hopefully there will be more collaborations with Focus on Liberia in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abby. We want to thank our viewers for staying here with us.
follow us every time, every day on Focus on Liberia. We are on YouTube, we are on Twitter and all social media platform. Until then, on behalf of all of us here at Focus,